with a lot of problems because of climate change. And uh, even under the sort of most ambitious climate scenarios from the IPCC, temperatures are due to continue increasing for quite some time. Um, so, but there's, there's, there's also a lot of variability in bleaching responses, even within single species. So here you can see two neighboring colonies, which this one on the right is obviously bleached and um, went on to die after that event, whereas the, the one on the left from the same species is healthy and managed to survive. So even within species in bleaching events, you do get big variability. Um, and when we look at these sort of more tolerant individuals that seem to be able to persist, um, that can give us indications of you know, how, how these, these populations might adapt in the future. Um, and really, yeah, I guess the talk that I'm going to give is, is built about the premise of heat tolerance. And there's a lot of different ways that people think about heat tolerance or measure it. Um, it's a complex, multivariate trait in the sense that there are lots of different genes that are going to be associated with heat tolerance. It's not that there's one simple heat tolerance gene. And it's multivariate in that you can measure it from the, uh, the color during bleaching. You can look at photosynthetic efficiency. Um, and I'm sure, like a lot of you will have read a lot of different papers on bleaching that, that use a huge variety of different approaches to, to analyze this. But at the end of the day, um, a colony which dies is gone. A colony which is alive is there to fight another day. So the definition that's sort of been emerging in, in sort of, I guess, our lab groups uh, discussion is that we, we like to define heat tolerance, at least for the work we're doing, as the ability for a colony to survive um, levels of heat stress that, that might happen in nature and that would cause mass bleaching in nature. Um, we've also been looking at quite small spatial scales. I mean, when you're doing research on the Great Barrier Reef, you've got thousands of kilometers of, of reef track to look at, uh, which is a huge amount of diversity and environments and everything else. But if you look at the map of Palau, it's probably orders of magnitude smaller. Um, and even within Palau, mainly the work that I'm going to present has been uh, from one reef. And there's a lot of reasons why you might want to look within populations. Uh, when corals spawn and um, eggs and sperm come into the water column, fertilization is happening within the first you know, few hours. Um, and other biological processes, they, they happen locally, like adaptation at the end of the day happens locally. So we've been interested to look within a population. And in this talk, I'm going to try and, it's a lot of stuff, but I'm going to try and go through three broad topics. Um, the first one, is just to ask how variable is heat tolerance within a single population. Uh, the second section, I'll talk about trade-offs or different associations with heat tolerance and other life history traits. And then at the end, I'll kind of zoom out from the one reef that we've been looking at to the rest of Palau to kind of answer questions about spatial variability and uh, you know how, how does these, I mean, these, these ideas that we have been exploring within a population, how does that scale? Um, so firstly, really delighted to say that this uh, study has just been published like two weeks ago. And I think this, so the, the data from this was an experiment that was done in 2019. And we spent a lot of time over the lockdowns analyzing data. I'm really happy to see this finally out. Um, it was co-led with uh, myself and Adriana and um, we're basically, we're asking what's the variability of heat tolerance within a single reef. Uh, this is the reef we've been working on called Mas er er Reef in Palau. Um, you can see it's sort of on the southeastern side. It's an outer reef, but it's quite protected. Um, and the, the colonies that we've been tagging and looking at are on this sort of end of the outer section of the reef flat there. Um, for this study, we tagged 101 colonies of Acropria digitifera. Uh, usually they're about two to three meters depth. And actually this colony is from a little bit further inshore towards the Rock Islands. And you can see those beautiful limestone <coughs> glass in the background. And on super, super low tides, 
pitches hit for a sort of it's sometimes exposed, but usually about two to three meter depth range that these colonies are tied to. Um, and then we sample six branches of each of those hundred colonies and bring them back to the aquarium, the Palau International Recovery Center, uh, and run this long heat spread experiment on them, uh, which goes for about five weeks um, at about two and a half degrees Celsius above the bleaching stress threshold. And I'm sorry if this gets a bit um, a bit methodsy, but I just want to do a quick digression here to talk about how we measure heat stress um, before we get into the results of bleaching and variability of heat tolerance. So if we look at the sort of history, uh, the idea, I guess, in measuring heat stress is that at the end of the day, having a, a temperature of 32 degrees, it might not be such a problem if it was just two days, but if it goes on for weeks on end, it starts to become a problem. So measuring heat stress as an accumulated stress uh, makes sense, and that's what uh, Wolf German here has been doing with the coral reef watch for a long time. Um, and it, if we look at the reheating weeks, it helps us to think about the big picture, I guess. Uh, here you can see temperature profiles from Palau in 1998 and 2010. And both of these years were bleaching years in Palau. And you can see that the degree heating weeks, this kind of colorful one at the bottom, reached about uh, six, just over six, seven degree heating weeks in those years. Um, and that's based on satellite data. And that, when you look at the, the <coughs> NOAA Coral Reef Watch uh, forecast, that links to a, a sort of alert, bleaching alert level two, expect bleaching and mortality. Um, basically, degree heating weeks, you measure it by accumulating heat stress, uh, daily heat stress temperatures, uh, anomalies over a period of time. You calculate those anomalies by looking at a uh, stress threshold, which is a sort of typical summertime temperature, M and N, maximum monthly means. Um, and then you sum that up over a 12 month period. So basically the take home for anyone who's not used to thinking about this metric is, Levels of degree heating weeks above eight are pretty bad um, if you're a coral. So the question is, right, we, we're looking at things in a tank and we're measuring temperatures with temperature loggers in those tanks. But can we link the heat stress there back to what we expect to see based on this kind of alert levels? Um, so if we look at the satellite data, that's roughly the shape of the satellite grid cell that's around the study site we've been working on. And we've got temperature loggers on the reef here. Um, so if we take that satellite baseline and we implement that into the temperatures we've been measuring on the reef, you can see that in black from that reef, you had in the last three years kind of two heat stress events of about four degree heating weeks. And from the loggers, it looks like it was only about half a degree heating week. So it's a bit of a mismatch. Um, Actually, when we then calculated the temperatures in the heat stress experiment, it was like mass bleaching in this experiment happening at three degree heating weeks, which didn't make sense. But if you look at the correlation between temperatures on the reef that we measure with loggers and the satellite data, you can just adjust. It's like not a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can adjust that baseline for the satellite data. And then if you implement this adjusted baseline, um, you get a much better match at least in the last three years of data since we've been measuring it from the reef and then put this back into the stress experiment in the aquarium and you can see there was about degree heating weeks of 10 in that um, in that experiment and this is kind of what you'd expect mass bleaching happening at those sort of levels and what this has allowed us to do is to then take our experimental data and actually kind of put it in perspective of, you know, what's been happening on the reef and, and projections that kind of use satellite data and this type of thing. Um, so digression over. Now let's look at the meeting responses from these uh, fragments. So six fragments per colony from a hundred colonies on the reef. Some of these fragments throughout this five week experiment bleach and die and others stay healthy and begin to get signs of, uh, signs of bleaching towards the end. Um, to measure bleaching and mortality, we did uh, 
what every once two days a status survey of every single nubbin, uh, and that was, I guess, about 600 uh, branches that you need to measure. So you need to check the status of each day. And actually, this year we just did one with three times that amount. So that was a really big job to do these surveys. And we've recorded four, sorry, five different status health status categories: uh, healthy, half bleach, bleach, partially dead, and dead. And you can. Because you've got replicates for each colony, you can then put this together as a sort of weighted average uh, bleaching and mortality index uh, that's been used uh, by Tim McClanahan um, in his 2004 paper to look at differences in bleaching between taxa. But that allows us to have one number at a particular time point for the status of one colony. So a colony with a BMI of one will have all of the replicate fragments dead. A colony with a BMI of zero will have all replicate fragments healthy. Um, so at the end of the experiment, you've got this kind of progression of bleaching mortality responses. Um, and we use a sort of categorical approach to look at which ones you might categorize as high tolerance or low tolerance. And this was based on what the endpoint mortality or survival is. So if all replicate fragments from a colony are alive, we consider it a high tolerant colony. If they're all dead, we consider it low tolerance. And this matches up pretty closely with that uh, bleaching mortality index. And what you're looking at there in blue and red is the categories. The bars is the mean bleaching mortality index through time. Um, so you can see that categorical approach pretty much matches up with the, yeah, the, well, they're based on the same data. But I guess one of the first questions you might be thinking is what's the role of symbionts here? Because different symbionts can confer different levels of heat tolerance. Um, but practically all of these colonies were dominated by Cladocotium C40 communities, um, which suggests that at least, you know, you'd expect uh, different levels of heat tolerance for especially Jurisdinium species, which can be found in the lab. But there was only one, two colonies here with jurisdinium uh, based communities, and it was really minor component. So it doesn't explain this big range of heat tolerances. Um, we've also, a master student from my group looked at the microbiome, and that didn't correlate with the bleaching responses either, which suggests that there may be a sort of host genetics component to this. Um, so I guess another nice thing to look at is the progression of the bleaching responses through the experiment. So the x-axis you can see went up to 10 million heating weeks. And throughout the experiment, you get these sort of bleaching mortality progressions. About a third of the community um, was categorized as a high tolerant colonies and a third as low tolerant colonies. And here you can see the the sort of bleaching mortality responses for each of those. Um, but that, how, how can we link this back to degree heating weeks? So if we look at the horizontal distance between these two curves, um, it's around, around three degree heating weeks. In the brackets, you've got the confidence limits there. Uh, but so this is looking at the kind of toughest third of the population, weakest third, and there seems to be about a three degree heating week difference between those two. But um, I mean, if a bleaching event sort of gets rid of 90% of the colonies and you're just left with the toughest 10%, you know, maybe that could be even, even tougher. So we then kind of did this, this experiment to basically, uh, if what we've looked at so far is a third of the population in each group. If we start to subset into the tails of heat tolerance, uh, by the time you get to the very tail, you'll probably have much larger differences. And this is one way of looking at the variance of the heat tolerance in the population. And here you can see this sort of subsetting simulation. As you get down to only 10% of the population in the top and in the bottom, this actually now translates to a difference of 4.8 degree heating weeks between the highest and highest tolerant and lowest tolerant colony within that population. And linking that back to the, the Noah Gold Reef Watch categories, that's almost like a categorical shift um, within one population. And okay, you're looking at the extremes of that population, but maybe you know maybe it's also important to look at those extremes if they're 
if at least the high ones are going to be the ones surviving. So we wanted then, well, this is already quite a surprising result. We then wanted to say, what does this really mean in terms of you know, future projections of climate change? Um, so how much extra time would having this sort of four degree heating rate higher threshold give you uh, under, under climate change? So we worked with Ruben Van Hoydon for this section. He provided us, there's a UNEP report that came out where he's produced um, projections of degree heating weeks globally. And he shared with us uh, future projections of DHW um, from 28 global climate models and two climate scenarios. And this is quickly showing that data. Uh, just degree heating weeks on the y axis and time on the x. And the left hand side is uh, an ambitious scenario where collectively we humans smash the climate agreement in Paris and reach 150% of the reductions that we've committed to. SSP5 is a worst case scenario where we sort of increase cold production and we really make a mess of things. Um, so the question here is if you move from Degree or uh, a bleaching mortality threshold of four degree heating weeks up to eight. That sort of corresponds quite closely to what we measured in our corals, where there's about a four to five degree heating rate difference from the lowest tolerance to the highest tolerance colonies. And then we also check that between eight and 12. Uh, and we measure what's the year when bleaching mortality conditions start happening every year for like a decade uh, window. Uh, so when does that start happening annually? So if we compare that year of onset between a bleaching mortality threshold of four to be heating weeks to eight, you can see that sort of gives you about a 10 year additional time until uh, those conditions are reached under climate change. And then, and it doesn't really matter which SSP, which climate scenario you're in, it's also 10 years for each of those. And what you're looking at there is a box plot across all of those 28 climate models. Moving from eight to 12, in the worst case scenario, you get about another 10 years in the, in the sort of best case scenario, or not best case, but the SSP2, that in, improves to another 17 years. Um, but this is kind of, again, it's, it's close to looking at the, the toughest 10% and weakest 10% of the population. So if you, maybe you were thinking about looking from the mean of the population heat tolerance to the, the most extreme heat tolerant colonies, maybe you can half those numbers. So what it's telling us is there is a really wide variability of heat tolerances. It does look like if you have those levels, you get a bit of extra time on the climate change, but it's not a huge amount of time. Um, so really action on climate change is definitely still needed. And this is quite a coarse way of looking at this, but it starts to put numbers on it and kind of tell us uh, something. So, kind of summing up that section. Um, so, yeah, we found quite a surprising uh, variability of heat tolerance within this population. All these colonies were dominated by C40 uh, cardiacopian symbionts, and the symbiont chameleon type didn't really correlate with the heat tolerance. And it's quite a surprising level of DHW difference between what the most heat tolerant and least heat tolerant can handle, which translated to 10 to sort of 17 years extra time and the climate change. Um, so that just gives us an idea. And this is again looking at one population, looking at one species. So the next section I want to talk about here is what are other associations with this measure of heat tolerance and other traits. So we know that you can get heat tolerance from some types of symptoms. And Jurassicium uh, species have been shown to provide higher heat tolerance to the colonies that support them. They're sort of less efficient photosynthesizers, so giving less carbon to the host. You got less food, you're going to grow less. So then that kind of comes at a cost. And these colonies or these Symbionts have been found to uh, give uh, or have been yeah, found to be associated with lower levels of growth in their hosts. And this study from Allison and Jones and Ray Godmas has shown that from the field and from the lab. 
But these kind of small differences in growth, when you scale that up to what does that mean for the ecosystem? Um, this study by uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz in black, you're looking at a future projection of, from a reef ecosystem model of a clay D uh, Jurisdinium dominated uh, coral community. And it actually then results in, they have a higher heat tolerance, but because of the lower growth, which kind of means you reach fecundity later, you're producing less eggs, um, results in a, a faster decline in, in reef coverage and coral coverage through those projections. Uh, but from our population, basically all the corals have the same to the moment. So the question kind of remains out there. For corals that have all the same similarities, can you also find these trade-offs? And from genetic studies, there's a lot of work that's suggesting that there, there should be trade-offs with heat tolerance. Um, if you think about any two things which require resources and you only have a certain amount of resources, you've got to partition into one thing or another. Uh, so we, we did a, a field study to try and see if we can find these, uh, these trade-offs when all the corals have the same similarities. So the same, same reef, the same species, different colonies. This is a, a group of 70 colonies that were tagged on the reef. Uh, can I just ask how much time I use that? Half an hour. Okay. Um, so from, from this reef, we tagged 70 colonies and then measured four traits. Heat tolerance, which is similar to how, we, how I've already described. The symbol community composition, but also fecundity as a proxy of reproductive output and growth uh, from uni photogrammetry, so whole, whole colony growth. Yeah, this was a different heat stress experiment with a similar profile. Um, I'm not going to go through these slides. Uh, I'm going to go through it quite quickly, but here we use the bleaching survival index, which is just the complement of the bleaching mortality index. Um, basically, I, we just did this so that a value of one relates to a healthy coral rather than a dead coral. Um, so in this case, you see that as the heat stress progressed, each line here is a colony, you see that uh, there's a reduction in this bleaching survival index. And then we consider heat tolerance in this study to be the average PSI three time. And there's quite a broad variability Again, as we also found in that other, uh, other study. Um, when we looked at the Symbiodonaceae community, there was again everything, almost everything, uh, dominated by Cladocosium C40 symbionts, and it wasn't predictive of the heat tolerance response. So then looking at fecundity, from each colony uh, in 2018, we just before spawning, we took two branches off that colony decalcified that, and then did dissections of the polyps, 10 polyps per branch, um, taking photographs and looking through the microscope of, uh, to, to count the number of eggs and look at the size of those eggs. And that was using this size extractor workflow, which I've been working on the last while. Um, if any of you have ever used ImageJ to circle things, I'm sure that you know the pain of using that. And it can be really slow. And this is just, it's nothing really that fancy. At the end of the day, you're just circling things, but it's a workflow that speeds things up. And you can sort of do things about half the time. So if you're maybe circling things and having a lot of pain with that at the moment, I'm happy to chat to you about that. It's like, if you could do machine learning, that would be much better. But if you just uh, have a thousand things you need to circle and you just want to get that done, this can be something that helps. Okay, so. The question then is, what's the association between this fecundity measure and heat tolerance? And it's practically a flat line. Um, this model was fit with a Bayesian estimation. So for that slope of that line, you can get a posterior distribution. And if you look at the sort of probability that that slope is positive or negative, it's pretty much 50-50. I mean, it's flat. So it doesn't seem there's any association between this heat tolerance metric and fecundity. Um, but looking at growth, and most of the information we have about trade-offs associated with heat tolerance is to do with growth. Um, this has been a collaborative, collaborative bit of work with a team from Ames in Sydney 
um, and they've been fantastic uh, to work with. And uh, Dan Pygas put so many hours into building 3D models for each of these colonies. Basically, um, every year from 28, sorry, from 2017, 2018, and 2019, those colonies on the reef were returned to. A sort of 3D photogrammetry uh, survey was done for the colony. The team in Australia built those 3D models. And here you can see one of those 3D models for colony 35. Um, so by the end of this, you've got three models for each colony. You can then start to compare those models and measure growth metrics and size metrics. And uh, across the 70 colonies, we didn't finish models for all of them, or maybe we couldn't find them in certain years. So there's 45 colonies that we have these uh, models for. And you see a huge variety of things. These are all scaled. So you can see some colonies growing. Other colonies reducing in size due to partial mortality. Um, and I think from this data set, there's really so many really cool questions that you can answer about growth strategies and how problems to grow. But really, from this, I'm just interested in measuring a simple enough growth metric, volumetric growth, or the live surface area growth. And I'll just focus on the first one for this talk. So, again, what's the association of heat tolerance? And we found a really unexpected result that actually there's a positive association between heat tolerance and growth. If we again use these Bayesian methods to look at that slope, um, there's a 94% probability that that slope is positive. So it's, we went into this thinking, you, you're going to find a heat tolerance growth trade-off. And as we started to get the results in, it seemed like a weak trend. And as we built more and more of those 3D models, we realized actually this is a positive association, which is quite unexpected. But it does mean, OK, so just to wrap things up for this section, again, within this population, we found a lot of variability of heat tolerance. They were all, they were all uh, hosting the same symbiotic community. And we didn't find any association with heat tolerance and fecundity, but we found this positive association with growth. And you might be thinking, right, you've got two traits. Surely there's a trade off. You've got so much energy, you've got to put energy into one thing or the other. Um, so surely you should find a trade off. And why would you find this positive association? Um, if we think about resource acquisition, uh, these, these colonies are all on the same reef, so they should have the same resources available to them. If you think about resource acquisition efficiency, how well can you acquire resources from the environment? What that would lead to is some colonies that have much bigger budgets of energy. So if you have a much bigger budget of energy, that's more energy to put into all of your traits, and you might sort of excel in all those traits. But if you're a colony who's not efficient at harvesting resources from the environment, you're going to have a small budget to play with. So it's lower amount of energy you can put into those processes. So then even though on a fine scale, in terms of resource kind of allocation within the coral, there should be trade-offs that happen uh, across the population, you see this apparent co-benefit. And this is something that um, one of the lecturers in Newcastle, Isabel Smalagang, has been working on trade-offs. Uh, in lots of different organisms. And this is something that's kind of been found in other wild populations. So it's saying that really within, within a species, when you have the same symbionts, there might not necessarily be these deleterious trade-offs associated with heat tolerance, which is probably quite good news. Um, so that's quite an interesting result. And we've written this, written this up, and hopefully that will be, that'll be published. Um, so now, is the last section of this talk, and I probably don't have that much time. Do I? Okay. okay, so this is kind of the scaling up idea of we've learned all these things from a single reef, but what does this mean for, or, or what do you find in other reefs across the land? Um, there's a bit of, yeah, there's interesting oceanographic dynamics happening in Palau, and uh, there's a, quite a lot of variability of, of temperature. So, there's studies like this one, which have been looking at uh, hotspots and thermal refugia and have identified potential refugia and warm spots on really big spatial scales. But of course, Palau, again, it's much smaller. 
Um, and this was some work that I've been doing with Simon Bonner in Canada, which was supported by this uh, Global Link Fellowship, which uh, the UKRI opened up a few years ago. And with Pete, who's my co supervisor down in, um, down in Brisbane. And we're kind of looking at the looking at the satellite temperature history for Palau over the last 35 to 37 years. And it comes through quite clearly. I'm kind of gonna go through this stuff quite quick, so I'm not giving you all the methods, but it comes through quite quick, clearly that there are regions that they get lower DHW, lower heat stress on average each year, um, and regions in the southwest that get higher than average heat stress. So uh, and, and this likely links to the fact that you, oh, you've, got, um, you've got a lagoon down here. So that's a lot of water retention, a lot of chance for water to heat up. Whereas up in the north, you've got a lot more flushing uh, from the open ocean, which obviously you can potentially cool things down during hot summer and that kind of thing. Um, so we already kind of learned from the last two sections of this talk that there's a lot of heat tolerance variability from that one reef we've been looking at, which kind of comes through as a a grey, uh, moderate, thermal, thermally moderate reef. Uh, but what about from these thermal refugia and hotspot reefs? How do the corals then look? And there's obviously a lot of mass bleaching data as well from this. So um, looking at the mass bleaching surveys that were conducted in 1998 and 2010, uh, you kind of get this expectation that there should be, or uh, yeah, looking at that data, there was higher levels of bleaching in the thermal refugia and lower levels in the hotspots. And it kind of this idea that uh, hotspot corals presumably get low, you know, low dosages of heat stress. It's some sort of training. Uh, so when a heat stress event does come along, they might know what to expect. Corals in a thermal refugia might be a bit naive. They haven't had that chance to train. So when a heat stress comes, there's a lot more bleaching. And that's what we see with that data. Which is across the whole community, but this year we did uh, we did the, a similar experiment to the 2019 experiment where we collected um, 200 colonies in total across all of the sites, three three hotspot sites, three thermal refuge sites, which was supported by us um, But again, another unexpected result. We actually saw that from the if we look at heat tolerance, it's this one one minus the average beam line. The median line is actually higher in the thermal refugia. So it seems everything I do in my PhD, I go out with a hypothesis and I come back with the opposite answer. Um, and again, if we so, so looking at the sort of population average or the median, see there's higher levels of heat tolerance in the thermal refugia. Looking at variability across uh, across the region, and this is the same kind of graph that you've seen before, which is look comparing the 10% subjects versus the 10% weakest uh, groups and fitting these curves for each. You see there's much more variability up in the north in the thermal refugia than in the hotspot within this species. Um, and if you look at the sort of upper level, there's slightly higher levels of the top 10% of colonies in the thermal refugia in terms of the DHWs they can handle. Although with the uh, error bars, it's probably a bit overlapping. But the lower level is actually much lower. So if you think of a population where you've got this huge distribution, now you bring a bleaching event in, you're probably going to see more bleaching up in the north because there's a lot of these colonies there that they're not heat tolerant and they, you know, uh, they're going to bleach quite easily. So you'll see more bleaching there, but it doesn't mean that it's actually a less resilient place because you actually still have the medium that's higher and you have these higher levels of the most heat tolerant colonies. So as we zoom in through the tectonic scales, it just gets more complicated and it gets really interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, there's also a collaboration with Daisy who's doing a PhD in Julia Barnes lab in Victoria, and she's got uh, DNA samples from all these colonies to look at host genetics and to look at symbiotes. So there's some really interesting stuff to hopefully come out of this soon. And the last section here, is kind of why I'm in Australia at the moment uh, in Pete's lab. So I've been using the ecosystem model that they've been working on. We've now got a measure of heat tolerance variability from our experiments in Palau. Um, there's other experiments that have been done in our group. 
that I haven't showed today before, but a selective breeding experiment that's shown the heritability of this heat tolerance metric we've been measuring. And you kind of, you know, can we then plug all of these things into an ecosystem model to try and look at uh, adaptation? And of course, we, I'm not going to be looking at adaptation in the sense of the true genetic adaptation of uh, different allele frequencies and this kind of thing, but can you model that on a, a broader and phenotypic uh, ecosystem level or population scale perspective? Um, so this is some future work that I'll be, that I'll be doing. And yeah, to wrap all of this up, so substantial heat tolerance variability, even within a single species, within a single population. At least when they all have the same symbionts, it doesn't seem there's major trade-offs with other traits, like we've looked at fecundity and growth at least. Um, and across even small spatial scales, you can find these differences in thermal regimes of different reefs. Um, and it seems you have really high variability within regions, within reefs, but there's also a slight shift between different regions, uh, which is interesting. If you were looking for somewhere to find more heat tolerant corals, maybe you just want to go to your local reef and you want to find out which ones are the most tolerant in that reef, because there's a lot of variability everywhere from what we've seen, um, unless there are specific places where you get genes which aren't found elsewhere. But I'm not looking at that type of thing. Uh, so, I mean, this is all just summing, summing things up. But yeah, I guess I just want to say with heat tolerance, I think it's really important to think about it in terms of mortality. Because at the end of the day, if the coral is still there after a bleaching event, then, and then it's, it's got the chance to continue uh, fitting in our genes into that population. And I think that looking at the long heat stress experiments really gives you the opportunity to relate things back uh, to the climate data. So what's next? There's a paper on this heritability that I mentioned that hopefully we can write and will come out in the near future, uh, which is Adriana and James and Bailey. Um, Daisy's working on the genetic stuff, which is going to be really cool over the next year. And I hope we can find some interesting things about adaptation with that modeling stuff in the end of the year. But yeah, a huge thanks to everyone. Uh, Sulang, which is from Ireland, uh, to all of the the people that we've been working with at Pickrick, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you.